I know uh, we've, we've had there's a couple issues that I, that I really want to talk about. I know we've had some questions about the violent crime, uh, obviously, that we've seen in just the last couple weeks in, uh, since Operation Ceasefire. And uh, I, I can tell you Operation Ceasefire is still in operation. Uh, we have increased uh, just recently the overtime that we're going to uh, be using for this. Uh, in addition to that, as we mentioned earlier, we are uh, have, we now have an operation covert cameras in various locations uh, that, that are operating. In the last 14 days, uh, although we've seen eight murders, none of those were in the ceasefire area. However, we have had uh, also two police-involved shootings. However, the violent crime. Uh, incidents that we've seen in the last four day, 14 days, we've seen a total of 29 in 14 days. Uh, in Zone 5, which is the location for Operation Ceasefire, three of those were even within our ceasefire area. Uh, but the largest zone that we've now seen these violent uh, crime incidents is uh, has been Zone 1, uh, which had 12 in the last 14 days and Zone 4, which has had seven, Zone 4 being the west side, Zone 1 being uh, downtown and north uh, Panama Park area. So with that, uh, I'll throw it, throw it open for any questions on the violent crime. Are we any closer to making an arrest in the mother-daughter murder case that happened two weeks ago? Uh, I, I, look, I, I can't talk about individual investigations and, and, and where they're going. I, I can tell you that um, you know we want to ask the, the public to still look, reach out, tell us what you know. Folks out there know things, call us, uh, 630-0500, or they can call uh, First Coast Crime Stoppers and remain completely anonymous and get a thousand dollar reward. But uh, but I can tell you we've had we have some great leads, not only in that case but in some of these others as well. So. Uh, that's that's about all I can can say on that. I have two more questions for you, sir. Uh, I know that we've also the anniversary of Amber Bass, the murder of Amber Bass, is also coming up. I spoke with crime stoppers earlier today, and they said that they have not had any tips since the first tip that came in the beginning of the investigation. Anything that we can add to that? I mean, it's it's almost been a year now, and still. No, not at this time. Uh, I'm I see the Bass family regularly, uh, particularly on my on my walks. Uh, but um, they know that we're doing everything we can in that case, and um, I, I can't go into I can't go into detail on that. Last one: budget is on Monday. I know it's a big time. We've got. I know you've always you're a big proponent of getting you know more officers on the street, getting more you know increasing manpower. Anything that we are expecting with this upcoming budget? Anything else that you're pushing for? Well, it's it's not it's not increasing manpower. It's restoring manpower. We're, we're trying to restore the officers that we lost. Uh, 40 of the police officers that we lost and restore 40 of the community service officers that we lost. Uh, I, we are in negotiations and it's been going very well. Uh, the, the mayor and I are, are in agreement uh, uh, that public safety is a, is a high priority for the city of Jacksonville. And, uh, I think you'll see that in the in the budget when it when we finalize it. On the gun violence, you mentioned that a lot of the recent crime that we've seen has not even been in the ceasefire zone specifically. Correct. Is that at all a concern? Are we maybe thinking about you know new operations or shifting operations as well? Uh, yes, it is a concern, and yes, we have thought about uh, shifting some. Uh, you, you know, I, I mentioned when we did this. That we we you know sent the message to the uh, city council members that some of them were Peter and some of them were Paul because we were getting ready to rob Peter to pay Paul and uh, a lot of the officers that we now have in the ceasefire area are in fact from other areas of town some areas where we now see some of the increased violence particularly in Zone Four uh, so yes that is a concern and that's why this restoration of officers is so critical. Even the, even the community service officers, because they, they are a force multiplier uh, for the police. 
by taking a lot of those administrative duties off of them that they now have to perform because we don't have community service officers. So that's, that's why that restoration of those officers is, is so critical, I think, to the public safety in Jacksonville. Look, we had a, in, in 2011, we had 1,750 police. We had, I'm not sure what the exact number of community service officers were, 52 or 72, something like that. Um, and we had the lowest crime numbers uh, and the lowest murder numbers we'd had in, in 40 years. Uh, then we started cutting. And now we see this uptick in violent crime. We see this uptick in murders. We see uh, now crime's still down overall because our property crime is still doing pretty well. Uh, but I can tell you crime is starting, well, I don't have to tell you, you know it. Crime is ticking up in our community, particularly violent crime. That's why it's important. What does the Bantry and Times Union, what does it say? I mean, you're at 4 o'clock giving talk about ceasefire, and at the same time across town, one of your officers is giving a briefing about another violent crime. I mean, people are looking at the, all of this and, and, and wondering, you know, what can the Sheriff's Office do beyond saying we need more manpower, we need to restore manpower? I mean, right. is there any other kind of thinking to... Well, to, to yeah, oh, yes. That? Look, look. I think you'll also see in the budget uh, there, there's going to be, you know, prevention and intervention initiatives. That, that's why things like uh, the Police Athletic League, uh, Pace Center for Girls, uh, all of these programs that deal with our youth out there. Because, like, I'm going to tell you, I, I do not subscribe to the idea that crime is about economics. Crime is about values. There are a lot of poor people out there who would never think of sticking a gun in somebody's face and shooting them or robbing them. Uh, it's not about economics. It's about values. And so what we need to do is start addressing that. And look, JCCI said it the best back in 2006 when I commissioned the murder study. They said the challenge facing Jacksonville is simply this. How do we raise young boys and girls to become nonviolent young men and women? So my question is, what are we doing in Jacksonville that we are raising more killers than we should be? What, you know, or than any other place in, in Florida? Why is that? There's and that gets to a, a, a whole array of issues uh, that, that I talk about, you know, when I say, look, by the time the police show up and we have a, a dead body on the ground, a lot of things in this community have already failed. There was the journey, and it, it was supposed to address exactly. many of these things. And and what can you do to, I mean, that's kind of, I don't know what it's... Well, I'll be doing the same it. thing I did last year, advocating for some of those journey programs. I, I'll tell you, one that really concerns me is ATOS, the alternative to out-of-school suspension. Now, you, you talk about crime prevention, keep those kids in a, in, in under supervision in an alternative to out of school suspension where they're just placed back in the neighborhood, having, you know, they're having babies, using drugs, breaking into homes. That's what you want to stop. Uh, and, and ATOS is an incredibly important uh, program. We had five locations. Now we're going to be down to one, it looks like. Uh, that needs to be addressed. So all of those crime prevention, prevention initiatives that deal with youth teaching them values, keeping them out of crime, all of those are incredibly important. You say you're going to increase overtime? Yes. Starting when? Has that started? or We've already started that. When did that start? That's, uh, the other day, when we started. Well, back just about the time we uh, announced Operation Ceasefire. Are you going to increase it again? <coughs> yes. That, so how much? Or, I mean, how? Well, that's going to depend on what? That's going to depend on tactical issues of how many officers we, we need in different areas. Do you have any kind so of So I, I can't give you a dollar. I can't that. give you a dollar figure right now. Now I can give you a figure when we're done. You're talking about the, um, the increase in crime in Zone 1 and Zone 4 in part because officers have been shifted um, for operations ceasefire. You no, I said, no, that's not what I said. What I said was we shifted officers and crime has now gone up over there. I, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that because we shifted officers, crime is going up. Yeah, explain to me what's happening there, though, a little more. I mean, what is the connection there? But I, I, I don't know what the connection is. But we moved resources out and crime went up. And I can tell you, just about everywhere we go, 
when we put resources in, we, we see crime go down. And that's why restoring these officers is so important because it, it's like right now it's like whack a mole. You know, you smash one here and it pops up over there. And so it, that's the challenge. Commissioner Shepard, you talked a little bit about, you know, teen violence and different programs and trying to restore some of those programs. I know we had, a, you know, a teen shot earlier today and another one, I think this is the second teen that was shot and killed in, in two days. I mean, right. it's it's baffling, but, but what what kind of, what can we do about it, really? It is. Well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, parents need to talk to their children, uh, their family members, you know, and uh, we need to we need to instill in people the sanctity of life again. I, I think we have a culture of death out there. That uh, that's why I say it's a values issue, and um, that's what needs to change. They need to understand that you know taking a life. Just what does that mean? And and I'm not sure they even understand how permanent that is. Uh, it, it's it's. Uh, but it's going to take this whole community to change that attitude. I apologize, but when you say you took officers out of an area and the, and the crime went up, what, what, which area did you remove or were they shifted out of? I don't, I, I'm sure it's been... Well, Zone 4. Zone, zone 4 is Zone 4. You yeah. moved folks out of Zone 4 to right. to enhance in the, in the ceasefire zone, and right. when that happened, the crime went up in Zone 4. Well, it has in the last couple of weeks, yes. And of course, there's been... This one this afternoon is in the ceasefire zone. So Correct. I mean, Which means our work's not done there yet, either. Okay. Although it is down, but not, how much not, is it not, down? I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, when when we did the report uh, about a week ago, it was about fifty some odd percent or something like that. Crime was down in the ceasefire zone. Yes. All well, the violent crime. Yes. Violent crime was down fifty percent in the ceasefire zone. Yes. About a week ago. Approximately. Now, uh, one other quick, anything else on violent crime? I know there's one other issue that, I'll, that, that I want to talk to y'all about, and that's uh, electronic surveillance, which has been a big, a lot, a lot of, we, we've been getting a lot of questions about this lately. And I want to clear up some things because I think someone has made an allegation that is simply not true. So, Two yes. quick things. You okay. mentioned with the overtime, are you looking specifically at the ceasefire zone or overtime across the board? Uh, both. Both? Okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, in going down in the numbers again, I guess I could get that afterward, though, is fine. Just the, yeah, how we, many we can give you those crimes. numbers after we've, okay. af after we've done the number four. Uh, look, on, on electronic surveillance, let, let me say this. There's, there's been a lot of questions about uh, electronic... Um, intercept of private communications through electronic uh, processes or equipment. We don't, uh, other than voice box, which is used in our wiretap uh, operations, where, when we get a, a T3, a, 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 that's a, um, in a search warrant which allows us to do a wiretap, which everybody's familiar with, the normal wiretap procedures, uh, it, that is called voice box. That we actually get a conversation. Uh, there are certain guidelines, a lot of different guidelines that go into how you listen to those conversations. But every every agency in America has done wiretaps for the last I don't know 50 years or 100 years probably. Uh, now the other the, the other things that I spoke about, one that was misquoted, I think is last, a few years back when I was talking about our ability to uh, locate cell phones through, they're pinging a cell phone to locate that cell phone. That's phase two of E911. Because, you know, when someone calls the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office on a landline, we get an address because it's already registered. Cell phones are not. You don't know where that individual's at. But they could be calling in on 911 on a cell phone. And prior to phase two of E911, we didn't have the capability to find that person. And that was highlighted for us, if, if you remember, the case out on Cybald Road, where the, the woman had been shot like three or four times. 
two other people that had been murdered already uh, in the home. And she called on a cell phone, but she was visiting. She didn't know where she didn't know where she was. She knew she was on Cyball, but she didn't know what the address was. We had a hard time locating her and getting uh, rescue services to her. So what this does, though, we're not picking up. It, we, we don't pick up her communication. We, we ping the, the phones bouncing back and forth between the tower, and it triangulates and tells us that's the location she's at. But we're not picking up a conversation. So the only thing that we have in use that picks up a private communication is a voice box, in our, which we do our wiretaps. Now, the other thing that we had, which we no longer use, was a device called Stingray. And I think we bought one of the, one of the upgrades for Stingray uh, back around 2007, 2008. That equipment very quickly became obsolete, and we no longer use it. Uh, because it was so expensive to keep upgrading, to keep up with the changes in cell phone technology, we quit tra you know, trying to keep up with that technology. And, uh, so, and again, that was simply pinging a, pinging a cell phone, not picking up the private communication. So I want to make sure everybody out there <coughs> understands, we're not listening to people's conversations uh, on these cell phones. Now we are through the through the voice box when we have a a, a wiretap uh, authorization, but beyond that, it's simply locating the phone, and that's mainly being done through our communication center. Anybody have any questions about that? And the Stingray as a surveillance device allowed you to go and identify which phones were in a certain place. Is that correct? That's kind of how it could be used. It could maybe go to the outside of the house and let you know who was inside by their phone or could let you know at least the number that right. was in use. Right. You can't do that any longer? Uh, no, we can. But uh, other agencies do. FDLE, the U.S. Marshals, others. others. FBI. Right. And do you FBI. partner with them to get that information? Like, how yes. do you get that when you yes. get it? That, that's how we get it. With, with FDLE or FBI? Or? FDLE, well, all of them depends on who's available. And, yeah. and what technology do they use? I couldn't tell you. you know, I, I don't know what it's called. They, I don't know. You have to ask them. But again, it's not picking up private communications. It's just locating the phone through electronic pinging. All right. Thank you.